exam from last year. So you should take a look at it, bearing towards the first midterm. First midterm would be on the 28th. And then I've also put uh, Introduction to MATLAB, which is a 50-page document. Very simple things, uh, array addressing, functions that we have seen. So it would be a nice review, just read through it before your midterm exam and make sure that you understand why MATLAB responds the way that it responds. Uh, so it's covering uh, a lot of things. That's kind of a review of what you should have seen in 2160. Okay, That's about a 50-page document. So take a look at it uh, before the first midterm as well. So if there are no questions then, uh, let's uh, review. Yeah. Um, were you given a sample quiz for the, say, for the coming quiz next day? <laughs> sample quiz for the quiz. <laughs> um, yeah, like you did in the first quiz. The sample midterm exam would be a good uh, material in the sense um, you want to know what type of questions there will be in the quiz, right? So maybe let me open up that um, from last year's. These are some really old exams. So the midterm exam would be something like this. It will contain a qualitative part of questions. To explain this, uh, what do we mean by lumped, dynamic, distributed, etc., Or solve simple algebraic equations. And then we haven't seen uh, algorithms yet. That will be in the second midterm. So the second question is about how MATLAB solves using FSOL or ODE 4.3, or BVP 4C, etc. And then there will be a question of this type. This is what I'm going to be focusing on the first midterm. Here is, we have seen a separation process as a sequence of equipment. Here is a reaction process as a sequence of equipment. When I give you the equations, mass balance for each tray, and there are, I mean, each stage, and there are end stages of the reactor. So, and I give you the specifications, okay? These are the known. So assemble the unknown elements into a vector. Assemble the, is the equation linear or nonlinear? Is it lumped or distributed? So those could be the questions. And then assemble the matrix A. If it is a linear one, assemble the matrix A. If it is a nonlinear one, assemble the set of functions that you will use to call F-solve, okay? So that would be a typical type of question. But in a quiz, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put maybe three or four of those types of problems that will cover the entire range of problems that we have seen that covers the lumped, uh, distributed, steady state, and dynamic. Okay? So there are four types that we have seen. So maybe one example of each one of those will be in the quiz. Okay? Is that tell you enough about it? Yeah. <coughs> Why is the class so thinly populated today? Is there anything happening? Or? I guess you won't know because you are here. <laughs> um, now, one thing that I am kind of concerned is, um, I mean, I, I, I will give you the, uh, an extra edge, I think, in terms of things that I hint at, but the, is the recording kind of encouraging lack of attendance? I don't want that to happen purpose of the recording is to augment whatever happens in the class. In the class, we do have interaction. You can ask questions and I can respond. You don't get those things when you're listening to the recording. Of course, I am preaching to the converted. You are already here. Those who are listening on this recording should know and hopefully come back to classes from uh, next time onwards. Okay, so in the last lecture, we spent the entire lecture developing a model. And that was an example of a model uh, for a steady state but distributed model. Okay? So the example that we, specific example that we took was the fin and um, it resulted in a linear boundary value problem. So you should understand the idea of what a boundary value problem is and be able to explain it, for example, in the short question in the first part of the exam. Okay? And it turned out to be a second order ordinary differential equation with two boundary conditions. So second order, two boundary conditions. If it's a third order, 
you'll have three boundary conditions. So you should be able to distinguish between a boundary value problem and an initial value problem. I'll reinforce that with a few examples today again. Okay? And the next thing that is important is we transform that into dimensionless variables. That process you should be able to do. <coughs> again, that could be part of an exam. I give you the equations, and I give you the dimensionless definitions, and I say transform that into a dimensionless form. You should be able to do that. And then the more important thing is convert it into an equivalent set of two first order equations. The second order equation is the same as two first order equations. You can convert that always. The reason that we need to do that is MATLAB expects only first order equations. Its algorithms are programmed in such a way that it will handle only first order system. Any number of equations. You can have 100 equations or 100,000 equations. It doesn't care. The applying the same algorithm, it will be able to solve. Okay? But you need to, so you need to convert a higher order system into uh, a system of first order equations. And the equations themselves, here it is in dimensionless form, it's the second order equation, ordinary differential equation, steady state, distributed model. Psi is your independent variable, dimensionless independent variable, theta is the dimensionless dependent variable. If you recall theta we defined as t minus t infinity divided by t0 minus t infinity and psi we defined as x divided by l. Now in this problem, T0, T infinity, L, they are all parameters, they are numbers, okay? And when we did that, we co combined all the parameters into a single parameter. That's the main advantage of going through a dimensional analysis. So this problem effectively depends only on M. No matter what combination of H and K and A and P and L you have, if it gives you the same M, the solution is going to be the same. So you could have two different fins with different lengths, different thickness, different area, different thermal conductivity, if they happen to be having the same value of M, they are governed by the same curve. And that curve is what we are going to see how to obtain. It goes from 0 to 1 in the y-axis, and it goes 0 to 1 in the x-axis. So that curve depends only on M. Different values of M will give you different curves, maybe like this. Okay. So this is M1, this is M2. This is M3, etc. So once we construct this family of curves, we have solved this problem for any fin. So we can design any, any fin. Now the next thing, that, as I said, is to convert the second order system into two first order equations. So we introduce two new variables, y1 and y2, and we obtain two equations for those two new, new variables. In fact, the first variable is simply y1 is simply theta, and y2 is simply d theta d psi. And if I had a third order equation, y3 will be simply the next derivative, d squared theta d psi squared. And I'll give you an example of that type. Now, the reason it is called a boundary value problem we saw is because the conditions are given at two lo independent locations in the independent variable. Psi is 0, y1 is 1, and at psi 1, y1 is 0. That is why you have a boundary to your domain. Okay? And at those e ends of the domains, these uh, values are given. And that's why it's called a boundary value problem. Okay. Any questions on that part? Now, I'm going to reinforce this by giving you a few more examples, and then we'll go on to MATLAB to see how to solve that. So do an example of converting a third order ordinary differential equation into three first order equations. And um, we need to do this, both for initial value problem and boundary value problem. Okay? Because both ODE 4.5 and BVP 4C require uh, only a system of first order equations. <coughs> so let me give you an example of a third order equation. d cube theta d psi cube. Uh, let me just put some numbers there instead of variable. So phi plus psi square d square theta d psi square plus 2 d theta d psi plus theta equal to zero. That is an example of a third order equation. Here, we don't care where the model comes from. Okay? So if, I, if, if you're analyzing a particular problem and you end up with having a third order equation like this, you should obviously need three conditions. And if the three conditions are given, I will give you an example of initial value problem and boundary value problem. The same equation. It is not the equation that determines whether it's an initial value problem or a boundary value problem. It's the additional conditions that determine whether it's an initial value problem or a boundary value problem. So in an initial value problem, I might have conditions like theta 
at psi equal to 0 is 1, d theta d psi at psi equal to 0 is 0, d square theta d psi square at psi equal to 0 is 2, something like this. The reason it's called an initial value problem is because all the conditions are given at the same location of the independent variable. That's what makes it as an initial value problem. You consider that as your initial condition. From there, you can march. If you can convert these three, th the third order equation into three first order equations, you can use ODE45 and march and get the solution. Okay? But in a boundary value problem, the way these will be given would be something like theta at psi equal to 0 is 1 theta at psi equal to 1 is 2, and maybe d theta d psi at psi equal to 1 is 5, something like this. Remember, it's a third order equation. You can only take three conditions. But in this case, the conditions are given at psi equal to 0, psi equal to 1. And the third condition is also given at psi equal to 1. The third condition could be given at psi equal to 0. But if you have any two conditions that are given at two different locations of the independent variable, then you will call that as a boundary value problem. Typically, you are interested only in the solutions over that boundary, in this case from 0 to 1. What would be the range of interest in the initial value problem? Starting at psi equal to 0, you would be interested in integrating to infinity, because that will have the meaning of a time. The independent variable typically takes the meaning of a time, so you'll be starting from initial condition. You would see whether you can reach a steady state. So you will integrate up to inf infinity. So in ODE 4, 5, you give T span. Okay, that determines wh where you want to start and where you want to end. Any questions on that distinction between an initial value problem and a boundary value problem? It is the same equation, but the conditions, the auxiliary conditions, determine whether it is an initial value problem or a boundary value problem. Now we need to convert this equation um, into three first order equations. That's our job so that we can use either ODE45 or BVP4C to solve the problem, depending on what set of conditions I'm going to use. Okay? So how would I convert that third order equation into three first order equations? As I said, it's a recipe. It's a rule. You just follow the rule blindly, and you will be able to convert that. Okay? But you need to understand that rule so that you can follow it in an exam. Okay? The rule simply says that I'm going to define three variables. Because I have a third order equation, I'm going to define three variables. Y1 as theta, Y2 as d theta d psi, and Y3 as d square theta d psi square. These are the three new variables I have defined, Y1, Y2, Y3, in terms of theta, d theta, d psi, d square theta, d psi square. So what I'm really interested in is finding theta as a function of psi. So the solution to this means find theta as a function of psi, a curve that satisfies this differential equation. In addition, it satisfies these boundary conditions. That function must satisfy those differential equations and the boundary conditions. That essentially means find the new variable, find y1. I'm going to solve for y2 and y3 also, but I'm really interested only in y1, because that's what I'm interested in in terms of theta. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, I have defined three variables, so I'm going to get three equations. How am I going to three, get three equations? I'm simply going to take the derivative of each one of these equations. So I'm going to run out of space. Let me see. So d y1 d psi. I'm taking the derivative of the first variable, and that is the same as, on the right-hand side, d theta d psi. So this is taking derivative of each, of each variable. Okay, So dy1 d psi is the same as d theta d psi, but what is d theta d psi? It's the same as y2. So from this one, I get my first equation. The first equation simply says dy1 d psi is equal to y2, which is going to be my first function. I need to get three functions so that I can write the function file or that I can be used with either ODE45 or BVP4C. Any questions on that? The second one is I'm going to take the derivative with respect to y2. So dy2 d psi is going to be d square theta d 
psi square. That is, I'm working with this equation now, taking the derivative of that function with respect to psi. But what is d square theta d psi square in terms of y1, y2, y3? That's just y3. So that gives me my second equation, which is dy2 d psi is equal to y3, which gives me my second function. <coughs> OK? <coughs> so the first function is simply y2. The second function is simply y3. OK? The third equation is going to be, t I take the derivative with respect to y3 with respect to psi. And that's going to be equal to d cubed theta d psi cubed. But what is it in terms of y1, y2, and y3? Now I look back at the original equation. It is at this stage I look back at the original equation. I need to be able to have both of them. I'm going to shrink. Can you guys see in the back? OK. So I'm going to now, here I have d cubed theta d size cube. So keep it on the left hand side. Push everything else to the right hand side. And substitute in terms of the new variable. So it's going to be, for example, minus theta. Theta goes to the right hand side. But theta is the same as y1 minus 2 times d theta d psi. But that is the same as y2 minus 3 psi square d square theta dy square, which is the same as y3 divided by 5. That is going to be my function 3. Okay, And that is going to be my third equation. Okay, so now I've gotten rid of theta and its derivatives, and I have three first order equations for y1, y2, y3 in terms of only y1, y2, y3, all the functions. f1 is y2, f2 is y3, f3 is this complicated expression that you have derived from the original equation. Now I can write a function and use it with MATLAB. But I need to come up with three conditions for y1, y2, y3. Okay? And these conditions are the ones that determine whether I use ODE45 or BVP4C. They determine whether it's an initial value problem or the boundary value problem. Okay? So let me do it for both. Okay? So that is the equation, the original equation converted into three first order equations. Let me do for initial value problem and boundary value problem for both of them. So what would be y1 at psi equal to 0? One. Make sure that everybody understands that. Okay? Why? Because I'm using this boundary condition. Theta is the same as y1, but theta is one. That means y1 must also be one. The next condition. What would you do with that? Exactly. It's d theta d psi is nothing but y2. That's how we defined y2. Okay. So this will be simply y2 at psi equal to zero is zero. And d square theta d psi square is y3. y3 at psi equal to 0 is 2. So now these three functions, together with this initial condition, if you use it with ODE45, you'll be able to solve that particular problem. Okay. Now we'll focus on the other problem, the boundary value problem. Okay, so theta at psi equal to 0 is 1, which will give you y1 at psi equal to 0 is 1. Theta at psi equal to 1 is 2. So what should that give you? Also y1, but at psi equal to 1 is 2. Watch this carefully. So you already know how to pass the initial condition to what e 4 5 it is this that we need to pass to the other function, BVP4C, for solving boundary value problem. And the next condition would be what? Let me see whether you can come up with that. Y2. <coughs> y, Y2 at? Psi equal to 1 is 5. So this will be boundary condition 1. This will be boundary condition 2. And this will be boundary condition 3. Now, MATLAB actually requires these fun uh, conditions to be written also as functions, meaning you need to write them as this minus that equal to zero. Okay? And that's how MATLAB requires. Okay? 
So move them all to one side. M minus 2 equal to 0, minus 5 equal to 0. So you have to give them as these functions. Whereas for the initial value problem, they are just numbers. You pass the vector 1, 0, 2 as your initial condition to ODE 4, 5. But when you saw, see that uh, BVP 4C, you need to write them as left hand side minus right hand side equal to 0. And that's how you need to pass three functions to MATLAB. Okay? Any questions on this process of converting a higher order system into an equivalent first order system? Let me ask you a few questions on this. Okay? Uh, would you consider this equation as a linear or a nonlinear equation? Would it be nonlinear because psi is being multiplied by itself? That's why I put that. <laughs> I wanted to make that point clear. Okay. So I have, and you have already noticed that, I have psi square here. Okay, that's what you're asking about, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make it nonlinear? The definition for nonlinearity is it should contain products of unknowns. What is the unknown in this case? Theta. Okay? Theta and all its higher derivatives appear without a product or sign or exponentiation or that. So it will be considered as a linear problem still. Okay? But it will be called variable coefficient because psi can appear. Psi is the independent variable. You know the independent variable. So there is nothing unknown about it. That's why it is not a nonlinear problem. It is a linear problem. So you could have the independent variable in any of these coefficients. For example, I could put 5 times psi cube. It will still remain a linear equation. But if I put, for example, something like theta square, that will make it a immediately a nonlinear problem. Or if I put, for example, here, uh, d theta d psi times theta, that will make it a nonlinear problem. Okay. So, but the process will still work. You will still be able to convert that into a system of first order equations, except you will have products of y1, y2, etc. So let me just erase that so that you don't misunderstand what follows below with that. Okay? So if you look at the three functions, the three functions f1, f2, f3 are linear because now it is in terms of y1, y2, y3. So function simply y2, function 2 is simply y3. Function 3 is y1 minus 2 y2 minus 3 psi square y3. But psi square is a known quantity, independent variable. So that is all linear functions. But if you have a product, then you will have y1 times y2 or y1 square or y2 square, things like that. That will make it nonlinear. But BVP 4C will handle either linear or nonlinear system. That's the beauty about MATLAB tools. They can handle, FSOL, for example, can handle nonlinear or linear equations. Of course, you don't use linear for linear equations because you can invert it with the backslash operator. And ODE 4.5 can handle linear or nonlinear initial value problem. And BVP 4C can handle linear or nonlinear boundary value problems. Okay, any questions on that? You guys are all very quiet this morning. <laughs> I assume that it's okay then, right? You guys are following what's happening. It's only when it comes to MATLAB there are a lot of issues, right? Okay, now we are going to go into MATLAB. So we know have, we have um, a boundary value problem, a second order equation. That's the one that we are going to solve, the heat transfer problem. So the first thing that I do is ask for how do I use BVP4C? That is the function that solves boundary value problems. Okay? So I ask for help to find out what do I need to do to prepare my problem for this particular function you will see a pattern that kind of repeats itself from FSOL to ODE 4.5 now to this. Okay? So the solution is appearing on the left hand side equals, that is how you would call it, either from <coughs> command line or from a script file, and the name of the function which solves a particular problem, and then the ODE function, there is a function handle, they call it a function handle, which is nothing but a function that you are going to write, and we will write it together. Okay? So this function is going to implement the particular equations that we have. So that function we need to write, which is, uh, represents the two functions, f1 and f2. Then in the, bound, in the initial value problem, the second position was t span, which was relevant to that problem, or what temperature range you are integrating, time range you are integrating. And the third one was initial conditions. 
Here it's the same idea. The second one, you specify what are the boundary conditions that I need to impose. So this BVP4C must know what equation I'm solving, what are the boundary conditions I am using. And the third parameter is, can you guess from the naming of that variable, S-O-L-I-N-I-T, what could could be? Initial, initial guesses, initial guesses for that particular. So that's, that says, just like f -sol, you have to provide what you think could be a solution, and it starts with that, and of course it plugs it into the differential equation and doesn't satisfy, it will continue to correct that. It has a mechanism for correcting it. Those algorithms you are going to see later on in the second half of the course. Okay? So the third parameter is then, an in INIT is an initial condition, uh, initial guess for the solution vector. And of course it describes, integrates a system of ordinary differential equations of the form y prime equals f of x, y. So it must be a first order equation. The f prime, there st y prime stands for first derivative. y prime equals f of x, y. In our case, this y is going to consist of, of the vector y is going to consist of y1 and y2. And the function f is going to consist of f1 and f2. We know what these functions are. We have already figured it out. Okay? So we need to write a program, a function file that will evaluate those. And what do you think x is here? The independent variable. In our case, x is the same as psi. x is the same as psi, the independent variable. And y is the unknown vector, y1 and y2, the vector y1 and y2. So these two functions could be functions of, of course, y1, y2, but also functions of psi. In our heat transfer problem, it turns out to be not so. But in the other example that I did, I deliberately put a size square term. So that will appear in there. <coughs> okay. And uh, there is a domain. In our case, that domain, when they talk about x, for the scalar x, uh, you need to understand each one of those. The boundary conditions has to be specified as a function. That is, now we are talking about how to write this function. B, C, F, U, N, okay? And it is explained briefly, very briefly here. That's one of the problems. If you're doing, learning these things for the first time, it is very difficult to decipher, okay? And that's why we're going through this in the class so that you get the pattern, and then it's the same idea for other algorithms, and you'll be able to decipher what they mean by this cryptic help, okay? But there are always examples as well you can go and study later on. So uh, this F of X, Y must be a column vector. Okay. If you have two equations, it must be of column two, uh, length two. If I have ten equations, it should be of uh, length ten. And vectors y a and y b that are defined in the boundary condition are conditions that are given at the left and the right boundary. In our case, it's going to be at a is the same as psi equal to zero, and b is the right boundary, which is the same as psi equal to one. So YA here will be a vector at the left boundary and YB will be a vector on the right boundary that I'm specify. Okay. So with that understanding, let's go and write the function. I have already given you the function in here, but I want to make sure that we can do it slowly uh, and you can follow and ask questions. Okay. So I'm going to write edit main fin. Okay, doesn't exist, create. Okay. I'm going to introduce, as in every lecture, I'm going to introduce a few new ideas about MATLAB programming. Okay. In this particular one, I'm going to introduce this idea of a sub-function. What is a sub-function as opposed to a main function? So I'm going to put, I could write a script file, but I'm going to write a main function, which is going to return my solution, and I'm going to call this as main fin. <coughs> and I'm not going to pass any variables into it, okay? Because this is essentially like a script file, okay? So you don't have to have input into functions. You don't have to have output from a function as well. But if you don't have an output, it will do the calculations. It may be producing a graph. And that's all you want it to do. That would be fine, okay? But often you will have an output uh, from a function which will be the solution. So what I want to do is, I need to give you a set of parameters for this particular problem. The problem that we are solving is 
let me put it back, th those equations. Now, this part is going to be a bit difficult, so please stop me and ask questions, okay? We are trying to now take these equations and write functions so that we can solve and plot, generate graphs of this type for various values of heat transfer coefficient or whatever it is that we are going to change, okay? So this is the problem I want to solve. And uh, what I'm going to do is I need to write these two functions, okay? So let me, uh, what should I do? Maybe I should write the script file or the function file. Let me write the function file first, okay? So let me just call it as sol equals or sol. Uh, f equals fin x comma y, okay? So I'm going to try to show you how these two functions, f1 and f2, are written first. And then we'll see how to use it from a uh, calling pro main program or a uh, function, okay? So this, these two functions I need to write. In, a, in addition, I need to write the two boundary conditions. So this function has m in it, okay? And it, the function, according to MATLAB, should bring in where is that? My apologies. I need to go back and forth. The function that I'm going to write is this function now. It's going to bring in the independent variable x and the dependent vector y. And it is going to return the function values f1 and f2. Okay? So that's what I need to do. Okay, so let me go back to those two functions. Okay, and open up the MATLAB function window, function editor. And I want to be able to see both. Okay, so the f first thing I need to do is calculate M. So I need to define all these parameters for you. So I'm going to define these as H is 0 0.5 and it has the units of watts per meter square degree C, okay? And P is equal to one, that's a perimeter, has the units of meter. And L is equal to 1.5, the length of the fin, has the units of meter again. Oops. If I make any mistake, please do correct me, okay? All I'm doing is defining all the parameters for this particular problem so that I can calculate what M is. And then K is equal to one. Its units are uh, watt per meter degree C, okay? And finally, A is equal to 0 0.5. That's the area, cross-sectional area of the fin. That's going to have the units of meter square, okay? So I have defined all the parameters, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Right? So I've defined all the parameters that appear in the particular uh, equation. So I can now calculate my M. M is equal to simply H times P times L square divided by K times A. Okay? That's fairly easy, straightforward to understand. Okay? The next one is going to be function F1. What is function F1? Y2, okay, uh, where is it, yeah, here it is, function F1 is Y2, okay, and function F2 is M times Y1, so these are the two lines that we need to write, so function F1 is Y2, and function F2 is M times Y1, remember, one of the rules that we have is, Every term that appears on the left, right hand side of an equation must be defined previously. So in this particular case, if you, the first calculation that we are doing in fact is line 8. So everything that appears on the right hand side, H, P, L, K, A, they were all defined in line 2 to line 6. They are all called local variable to that function. Okay? So in the workspace, they, you won't know those values. Only when the control is transferred to this function, you will define those variables locally use them, and when you get out of this function, you're going to get back only two values. Those are F1 and F2. So a common mistake is that you put F here, 
but you don't have F here on the left hand side, then nothing goes out. So whatever appears on the left hand side of the original function equation must be calculated inside. Now where does Y2 come into this function? Where did we define it? When we call this vector. Okay, you have to send a vector of length 2 in there. So Y1 and Y2 are defined there. So we save this and we test that it works. How do we test it? Uh, what was the name of the function? Main fin. I think you guys are getting the hang of it. Uh, 0, 1, comma, uh, 1, comma 1, something like this. So what this is going to do is it's going to call that function and associate with x the first location, the first variable, so two numbers, okay? And associate it with y, the second two numbers, y1 and y2. And so that function works without any syntax errors, okay? So this is what MBVP4C will do. It will keep sending to this particular function the x location and the y1 and y2. Because x was the independent variable, you wouldn't have to state it inside the function. You could just type it in whatever you call the function. Yes, that's a very good question. Because it is an independent variable, why don't I pass known values? But I'm not solving this particular function. BVP4C is solving this function. So it is going to send the value. Currently, I'm trying to get the solution at x equal 0.1. So what are the values of the function? So it will ask. It will probe this function. So the communication is going to be between BVP4C and this function. Just like for FSOL, it was between FSOL and the function for ODE45, ODE45 and the function that we write. In this case, BVP4C will continuously interrogate this function, sending different values of x. When x is 0.1, what are the function values? When x equals 0.2, what are the function values? Because it needs to drive all those functions to zero. Okay? So I, I just need a placeholder, and that is how MATLAB BVP4C is written. Okay? So I need to conform to that. So if you see the instructions, that's a, that's a reason why they have put the structure of this function is it must be able to pass x and pass y, and it must be able to get back the function value. Okay, the BBP four C must be able to do that. Okay, so I've written the first part. Yeah. How does X come into play when you're in that function? That's a good question. What, when would X come into play? In fact, this is why I deliberately put this particular problem. If I have psi square, psi is the same as X, the independent variable. Okay, and if you go into this this problem, you will notice that in function three. I have psi. So when I'm calculating function 3, I will be able to use x. So there are some problems that would depend on the independent variable in the functions themselves. Okay? The BVP4C is a very general boundary value problem solver. So it needs to be able to handle all cases. Okay? It turns out that in our particular example, x does not appear in those functions, f1 and f2. So we're not making use of it. That's why I could send any values and it's ignored. Okay, it's a good question. These observations are the ones that tell me that you guys are getting it. So please keep asking those questions. Okay. So we have written that function. Uh, uh, I saved it in main fin, I guess. I'm going to create another file which is going to be writing the boundary condition. Okay. So say new function. Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> if I create that, it gives me all the options already. Okay, so I'm going to put two placeholders and then I'll explain what those are. Okay, uh, fin BC, boundary condition, and it's going to return, uh, I'm going to call this variable as G. It doesn't matter, it's a local variable. Okay, so this function is going to take in two input value variables. Okay, and those are the boundary conditions on the left hand side and the right hand side, and it's going to return the function that evaluates those boundary conditions. Okay? So this is going to be this is going to be implementing, let me show you what we are trying to implement. Here is the function. Okay? We are going to be saying that y1 minus 1 equal to 0. That is the first condition at the left boundary. And then y1 is equal to 0. 
at the right boundary. This is at A, x equal to A in our program, which is the same as psi equal to 0. This is at x equal to B in our MATLAB language, which is the same as psi equal to 1. So these are the two equations that we need to calculate, or BVP4C must be able to calculate so that it knows what are the boundary conditions we want to impose. Okay? So y minus 1 equal to 0 and y1 equal to 0. One is on the left side, that is at location A. The other one is on the right side, at location B. Okay? So we're going to say that the residual is equal to, it's going to be two, two conditions. Okay? The first condition is going to be YA1 one minus 1. Okay? And then the second, oops, what, what did I say? I'll just say G. Yeah, sorry, my apologies. G is equal to YA minus 1, that is one condition, which is going to be a vector of length 2 also, because we have two conditions. And then YB of 1. What kind of a vector is that going to be in line 4? It's a column vector because I have put a semicolon there. Okay? So the first element will contain the first boundary condition. Okay? Where is YA defined? YA is going to be a vector of length 2. Okay? YB is going to be a vector of length 2. Okay? So I'm saying by putting YA at 1, what I'm saying is on the left boundary for the first variable, Y1, the condition is that minus 1 should be equal to 0. And then here on the right boundary at 1, okay, the first variable, theta, must be equal to 0. Now if I change this to 2, what would happen? second variable which would be the derivative of the function. d theta d psi at the right boundary is equal to 0. If you remember last class we saw that as an alternate boundary condition. Okay? So you could simply change the boundary condition very easily. Let's just put 1 equal to 0 now. And we want to test that. Okay, so we go to MATLAB and what was that called? Fin, fin BC. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Fin BC. How would I test that? What number? Uh, yeah, it will give me a warning message actually. Let's do that and see. Uh, oops. So what do I pass next? Yeah. So I could put uh, 1, 2. 1 comma 2. So that will be for YA. Okay, I need to pass two values. Okay, comma, YB also going to be a vector of length 2. So it's going to be maybe 0, 1. Do you guys understand what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to test. Yeah. Um, if that's like the left boundary and the right boundary, why is it more than one number? The boundary is one number? Because I have two variables at the left boundary, y1 and y2. I have two variables on the right boundary, y1 and y2. But I cannot specify four conditions. I can specify only two conditions. I can specify these two conditions in any mixed form. I can specify the condition for y1 on the left, y2 on the right, or y1 on the, uh, y2 on the left, y1 on the right. I could mix and match. Okay? So, the program again is written in a general form so that you can handle any kind of specification on any of the variables, the function or the first derivative, either on the left side or on the right side. Okay? But there are two elements in that vector because we are solving a two by one problem, two equations. On the left side you have two variables and we need to pass. But what would happen is inside that function you will notice that the second one is not used at all. If you come here, I'm using only the first element. So whatever you are putting in the second element of YA is not used. Okay? And the same thing happens to the YB. But the structure is such that you need to pass these two information to give you the flexibility that it could be Y2, not Y1. YA1 or YA2 or YB1 or YB2. Again, it's a very good question. Any other questions? So let's test whether it works. It did. Why did it produce two rows? And what is the message here? The message says, FinBC is a case insensitive match. 
That is, it's trying to match. It's forgiving. Even though I made a mistake, it says, okay, I'll search for you. If it matches, I will use that. But it's a warning. Okay? In case I do have two different functions, I don't, I don't want to use that uh, wrong one. Okay? Uh, the reason I'm getting G and AMS is because I have not put a semicolon at the end of that. Okay, now I save that. Okay, now I've written the two functions. I've defined my problem. Now I need to be able to call the MATLAB solver to take these two functions and solve my problem. So I need to write a script file which will call these two functions. Okay. Um, let me go back and a new script file. Okay, what does the script? What should the script file contain in this particular case? It should contain a call to BVP4C. So it should contain solution equals BVP4C, and then the set of arguments. The first argument is going to be what at main fin comma. The second one is going to be fin bc. The third one is going to be solve init. Now, if I just do that and execute this function, will it work? Why not? I don't have the solve init defined. I need to define what are the initial conditions. That is, I need to still define what is my domain length, goes from 0 to 1, and what are the initial values for y1 and y2, that is theta and d theta d psi, in the domain. Okay? So I'm just going to give my initial condition. I'm going to define my domain as 0 to 1, as I have here. But I'm going to say, take theta to be 1 everywhere, and take d theta d psi to be also, I mean, to be 0, for example. If the function is constant, its derivative is going to be zero. Start with that as your initial guess for the temperature profile. So it's a flat line. And then it should be able to change that. Depending on the value of m, it should be able to find the actual curve that satisfies the differential equation. So how do I specify that initial condition? In what syntax? In what MATLAB terminology? So we need to look at what MATLAB says about solve in it. Okay. <coughs> So the sol in it should contain in the first position, remember, this is going to be a bit difficult to, are, have you guys seen structures in 2160, what a structure is? You know an array, you know a variable, but structure is another form of variable. Okay? Let me just give you an example of what a structure is in a simplistic way, and then we will see what that explanation means. I can create a variable, for example, as name dot first. That will be called a structured variable. Okay? And I can put in there, okay? then I can create another variable called uh, name, name dot last equals something. You can put any variable. Okay? So it's, it is like a variable, but it's a little bit sophisticated. Now, if I just type name, name is called a structure. It has a substructure called first, which carries the first name of a person, for example, and it has a last. So I can say, for example, name dot first. It will print only the first name. That is the storage location. It's a data structure organization. Okay? So if I just type name, it gives you the complete structure. What is the first and what is the last? Okay? Sol in it turns out to be such a structure. Why did they do that? Why did they make our life difficult? They actually make our life easy in using it once you understand the idea behind what a structure is. Otherwise, what would I have to do? In fact, in the earlier versions of MATLAB, this is what they had. You would have to pass the domain as a separate parameter, and you need to pass the initial condition as a separate parameter, which you can do. Okay? So in the third location, you can say x goes from 0 to 1, and the fourth parameter says these are the initial conditions. But they chose to limit to only three positions that you need to specify. The function name, the boundary condition function name, and a structure which takes all the information about both the domain range, which is going to 0 to 1, 
and the initial condition. Okay? And that is what they are trying to explain here. Sol in it dot x1. Okay, so x this could be an array as well. So the dot x, sol in it dot x is a structure that contains the information about the domain of x. X goes from 0 to 1. Okay? So sol in it x1 is equal to a, the left boundary. Sol in it xn is equal to b, the right boundary. Okay? And uh, we really don't need to actually construct this structure. They have given us a function that actually does this structure. Okay? So, and the, the function is called BVPINIT. It's really getting difficult now, right? If I ask for help, BVPINIT, this function helps us take the input for the domain and the initial condition and construct the structure as an output. Okay? So it tells you BVPINIT. The first parameter to that is the range of x. The second parameter is the initial condition can in fact take third parameters, etc. Okay? So th this is the thing that we need to put in the function before we can make it work. So sol in it equals, we make a call, bvpinit, and then the first parameter is a range of x. So it's going to go from 0 to 1. Okay? And I can specify this as simply 0 to 1 or 0 in steps of point 1 to 1. Okay? So go from 0 to point, from in steps of point 1 to 1, in all these places, find me the solution. Okay? Not only at 0 to 1, but all these intermediate positions. Comma, and YNIT, that is the initial condition for the two variables. And as I said, we are going to just let that be equal to 1, 0. Please, any questions on that? Th those are my guesses. The, the first variable there, 1, is a guess for theta, which is the same as y1. The second is a guess for y2, which is the same as d theta d psi. The function is constant, the derivative is 0. Okay? And this is my domain, which defines from 0 to 1 in steps of point 1. Okay? That's all I need to do. Then sol in it will construct the structure, and that structure is automatically passed. Okay? So if I save this, uh, main script, for example, I can run this. Do you think it will work? We don't know. We'll try. Okay. What happened? It actually ran and it returns solution, SOL, which was on the left hand side of that function here, SOL. Okay. The solution is contained in that, but the solution is also a structure. Okay? So if you do, if you do sol solver, it's going to tell you which solver used to generate that particular one. If you understand the structure, what do you think this should print? The x values. At, at those locations, it found the solution. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, up to 1. Okay? And... Um, if I do SOL Y, what do you think it will print? Now, can you interpret what these values are? You have obtained the solution, okay? but you need to interpret. What are this first row? There are 10 values. We put 10 locations for X. Those are the Y1. Those are the theta. That's the temperature profile. What is the second row? So y2, that's a slope, d theta, d psi. Okay? Now if I want to plot it, I can say plot. How would I plot that? That's a quiz. See whether you can write. Sol dot x, x, comma, sol dot y. Sol dot x, comma, sol dot y. One. Now the question is, there are obviously few who are doing very well, but I want to know if everybody else is able to understand how we did this, and when I write something like this, you should be able to decipher it, or you should be able to write it yourself. If you're not able to do that, you're not going to be able to solve the assignment problems. Okay? That's my temperature profile.
I gave it as an initial guess of one everywhere on the top, but this is the actual profile. Okay. Any question? And you can see that the slope is always negative. That means y2 must all be negative. That's why these numbers are all negative. Okay. So you should kind of make those checks to make sure that it is a reasonable profile. Any questions? Do you have a question? Please don't hesitate. Yeah. This is taking the first row. Remember, in an array, the first index refers to the row, the second index refers to the column. So here it says, take the first row, all the columns. So this uh, sol dot y is actually an array which contains two rows and ten columns. Okay, so it is taking the first row and all the ten columns. Question. Yeah. Why did I use the first row? Because, as I said, y1 is equal to theta. I want only the temperature profile. If I want the slope of the temperature profile, then I will plot y2. Okay? If you understand this, you're really doing very well because this, is, this gives you a whole set of powerful tools to be able to solve ODEs of any type initial value, boundary value, any order, any number of equations. The concepts are simply generalizations from here. You've seen all the basic ideas of how to set it up, how to call, how to extract the results. Okay. So if I want to put this into the script file, I can do that. I can just say here, plot sol.x, comma, sol.y, one, comma, colon and that. I can go on embellishing this with other calculations. Okay. Now I'm going to show you the function that I've already written that introduces a slightly uh, a slight variation in terms of sub functions. Here what I did is I wrote the script and I wrote two functions. I saved them on separate files and then I called them in these two positions, main fin and fin bc. Okay. But if you look at uh, main underscore fin, that's a function that I wrote, it will have all the elements that we have seen. Okay? But I made the first one itself a function. Instead of a script, I made it into a function. And when I do that, I'm allowed to put additional functions in the same file. And these are called sub-functions. So in this case, starting from line 10 to line 20, I have a sub-function. What does that sub-function do? It does exactly the same thing as I did before. Define all the five variables. Calculate M, calculate F1 and F2. But I give it a function name fin. This is not saved as an M file. There is no file called fin.m. But if you notice in line 3, what did I do for calling that function? Fin. So when it encounters that, it checks inside that function itself to see whether you have defined a function called fin. It doesn't check the M files. You are not going to need a script file. It's called a subroutine, I guess, if you will like. It's a routine that is not known outside in MATLAB environment, but it is known only when you are executing the first part. So this is the function that you can execute, and it is going to call and transfer control to fin. So it's kind of like a local variable, but just for functions? It's local, exactly. If you want to think of it like that, a local variable is known only inside that file, right? It's a local function, which is known only inside that function. It's a very good way of looking at it. Okay? So if you're going to use this function only for this, okay, then it makes sense to not clutter your uh, directory with lots of functions. You don't know what is what. It gives you some ability to organize it. Okay? And the same thing with the boundary condition. Okay? I called it fin bc, ya, yb. Yeah? Um, why wouldn't you have to define all those functions before you call them? Why do I have to define this as a function? Like, why wouldn't you have to define those above that function? That, that's a good question. How do, should these functions come above or below? Okay. So that has to do with how MATLAB parses this, meaning how does it scan and figure out. When you, for example, execute, I go to the main function and then say main 
fin. Main underscore fin is the function that I showed you just now. Okay, the control is passed to that function. Okay, and when uh, your question is, how does it know inside that function that fin is inside it? When I make a call to this, oh, I said a break point there. Let me take that. Okay, so when I make a call to that, it goes into the main function and it scans the whole file. And when it finds at fin, it says I'm going to scan inside that function first throughout the file to see whether I can find it. Then only I'm going to come out and see whether I can find it in a workspace or in the path. Okay, so it, there is a certain order in which it searches. Okay, so you don't have, you can put it anywhere. You can put it and anywhere in the sense you cannot put it f uh, as the first part of it because the first part of it should be the main function but then the sub functions could come anywhere for example this could come first before that. you could switch these two functions order and it will still work but you cannot put it as the first it's function where you're calling the control it's going to read it just in the order that you have it in the main function yes yeah, yeah. It's going to transfer the control and it's going to start executing from line two onwards in sequence. And when it comes across a name, it's going to search inside to see whether it finds it or not for the sub function. Okay? So the order in which you write these functions is not important except for the main one. The main one should come first, others can come in any order. And these are called sub functions and their scope is local. They are not known outside. Okay, if I go to the for example here I have fin. But if I go to main and then type uh, fin, you'll know nothing about it. Okay? So that's the idea behind uh, a sub function. Any other questions? Okay, so we have learned how to, mod to build the model, how to prepare it for MATLAB, which would be the things that will be examined in the midterm exams, and then we learned how to solve it. So you will have an assignment on this. We'll have an assignment on ODE 4.5 and one on BVP 4C. Okay, that's where you actually learn how to implement it and become comfortable with it. Then the third part of the task is to analyze process conditions. Now you are a chemical engineer. So what does this mean? What does this temperature profile mean? Is this fin operating under efficient condition? Okay. Uh, before I do that, let me show you what would happen if the boundary condition is changed to Remember, we saw two types of boundary conditions that are possible at psi, at psi equal to 1. So I'm going to look at the change boundary condition. Change psi d psi, sorry, d theta d psi at psi equal to 1 is 0. Physically, that condition means that the tip of the fin is insulated. There is no heat loss from the tip. Heat loss is only from the top and the bottom. So the heat comes in and it is lost from here but this is insulated or it is so thin there is no area for it to heat uh, to be lost through that. If that is the condition, it is a physically meaningful condition, then the problem has to be changed by saying and this the condition is d theta d psi at psi equal to 1 is 0. Why does that represent what we call an insulated condition? Remember the heat flux Q is given as minus k dt dx. So if the derivative is zero, that means there is no heat flux. So if you put an insulation on the top, on the tip, then there will be no heat loss through that. So that is a physically meaningful boundary condition. So how would we impose that condition in our BVP 4C? We already know what is d theta d psi? Y? Y2. So all I need to do is Y2 at psi equal to one is zero. That's all I need to do. Change that particular boundary condition, then I will get an insulated tip solution. Okay, So how do I do that in MATLAB? Here is your opportunity to fix it. I give you this function and I say go and change that boundary condition. The tip of the fin is insulated. What should I change in this code? There's one thing I need to change. That would be part of an exam. Okay, I can give you the code and say this is what I need to. This solves this but I need to change it. See whether you can alter it. 
change on the right boundary, so it should be YB. And if I change that to 2, then it is Y2 on the right boundary. B says it's on the right boundary, 2 says it is Y2. And Y2 is d theta d psi. So it's going to impose d theta d psi equal to 0. Okay? So that's all you need to change. It's not going to take a long time in an exam to answer that once you know what you need to do. Okay? Now if I want to solve, let, let me ask you can, you, can you guess what the temperature profile will look like? Right now, the temperature profile looks like this. And if you look at the gradient, the slope of the function, it's not 0 at the tip. Right? There is a finite temperature gradient at the tip. That means there is some heat loss. How would that profile change? If you have to sketch it, what would you, how would you sketch it? The slope has to be zero, right? So the curve should do something like this. I guess I cannot draw it there. The, yeah, it should be something like this. The slope at the end must be equal to zero. It may be like this or it may be like this. But the point is that the slope must be equal to zero. In this case, the slope was not equal to zero. Okay? So let's just expect that and then try to run it and see whether it does, in fact, do that. There you have. Okay? So then now it shows that the slope is approaching zero here. That's what the condition that we impose. Okay? Any questions on that? Now, process related questions. What would happen if I decrease the heat transfer coefficient, H? Intuitively, what do you think should happen? Okay, so we need to go back and understand the model. We are saying that the heat is coming in through this and it is going out through the top and the bottom. And that rate is proportional to the H. So if I have a fan that is blowing on this fan, I'm going to increase my H. I'm going to very effectively remove the heat. Okay? That means the heat that comes in is all going to go and the tip would be very cool. But if I decrease my heat transfer coefficient, then I'm not transferring a heat as efficiently as possible. So all the heat that comes in is going to go, go, go to the end and heat it up. So the fin will be hot. Okay? <coughs> so the effect of heat transfer coefficient then is increasing heat transfer coefficient is going to lower it. Decreasing the heat transfer is going to increase the temperature. So if I give you a graph and a quiz and say plot, <coughs> sketch, sketch the temperature profile that you expect when h equal to 0 0.05 and h equal to 50. What would that profile look like? When h equals 0 0.05, it's going to look something like this, if I have an insulated tip, the zero boundary condition at the other end. But if I have 50, this is h maybe 0 0.05, low value, that's what I mean. And when it is 50, it may be something like this. Still it's zero, but I mean, the derivative is zero at the tip. <coughs> that means by looking at this graph, I can say whether the fin is operating efficiently or not. For example, if the fin temperature profile is like this, I'm probably using only 30% of the fin to transfer the heat. The remaining 70% is wasted metal. And if it is mounted on a car or on a rocket, I'm carrying this weight unnecessarily. Right? So the optimization problem will come in there. You can say, what should be the ideal temperature profile so that I have, I don't have this situation where only 30% of the fin is heated, the rest is all cool. Okay? Or I don't have the other situation where not much of heat is being transferred, so the entire fin is hot, but it's not getting rid of the heat. Okay? So an ideal profile may be one that comes down like this, but just becomes tangent to that here. Okay, <coughs> So to answer those kinds of design related issues, we need to be able to change the parameter H and regenerate the solution. Okay, You all know already how to do that, right? Any ideas? How would you do that? Do you remember from previous lectures? <coughs> exactly, that's what I'm looking for. Okay? Declare H to be a global variable. So here is the function that I have already pre-built. And then put a set of values for list of heat transfer coefficients. In this case, I'm taking it from 0 0.05 to 50. And then I put hold on. Why do I need that? What does it do? 
it adds the graphs to the same uh, figure. And then n equals length of h list. So I'm counting how many values of heat transfer coefficient I have in the h list. And then I set up a loop. Do the calculations as many times for i equal to 1 to n. And you can pass only, I mean, you can pass the entire array, but I'm passing only one value of h. So I declare h as a scalar variable. And I'm picking from h list one value at a time. Okay, And then the rest are all the same as before. So all I need to do is put a loop around it to solve it many times, set the values for h that I want to solve, and then run this function. <coughs> the rest are all the same as before. Okay, But here I have to put global h, because I need to pick that value from the global space. And that's where the h values gets used. Okay, That remains the same, but it just colors it. MATLAB is nice and sh warning us that it's a global variable in a green color. Okay, So if I run this, I should get <coughs> for 0 0.05. I guess I had some previous graphs, 0 0.05, point, what are those numbers there? 0 0.5, 1, 5, and 50. So this will be for 50, that particular graph that you see. That says only up to 0.3 of the length, 30% of the length of the fin is hot. The remaining are all. When theta equal to 0, what does it mean? Remember, how did we define theta? t minus t infinity. So when theta is 0, that means t is t infinity. So the entire 70% of the fin from this point on is at room temperature. Okay? <coughs> so it allows you to explore that kind of uh, process-related questions. What happens when you have heat different heat transfer coefficients, which are done typically through fan, blowing, blowing a fan over the fin, for example. Okay? Any questions? Yeah? So the Yeah, in this case, yeah, the one that would just come in and just dissipate all the heat and hit a re zero slope, I would think, yeah. <coughs> Did you have a question? Um, for, I have for this uh, function. Yeah. We had to declare H as global again. Yeah. But if, if I don't. That's a good question. Actually, I don't know the answer to that. If I don't use global, will. If you will don't put global there and you still type in M. I don't know. Is that that's your question? What, what was your comment? I was saying that you, well, I guess that's the first time you define those variables. Yeah, this is the first time I'm defining th these other variables, but h I took out and replaced it by global h. <coughs> and we, we can try it. I think what you are suggesting is, is just like this function knows about the sub-functions, does it also know about the variables? Do I need to declare h as global? <coughs> Easy to try, <laughs> right? It will give us an error message. There it is. Lots of error messages. So the local variables are still local to the sub-functions. Okay, that's that. I think that's what your question is. It's a good question, right? <coughs> I didn't know the answer to that. So but in each function that you are using that variable, you have to make it as global. Yeah. See, those are important questions because I also learn from some of the things I haven't thought about before. Okay. But the thing that you need to know is try it out. If the, such a question occurs in your mind, then try it out and you can fi figure out the answer yourself. If you can get that ability to learn on your own, I think we would have achieved what, uh, more than achieved what we need to do in this course. Okay. You need to gain that confidence in MATLAB that you can do it by yourself. <coughs> okay. Any other questions? How many of you feel, let me just poll on the other ex end of the spectrum, totally lost in this course? I hope there's nobody there. If you're keeping quiet, I won't know. And uh, <coughs> that is something that concerns me because in the assignments and quizzes I'm seeing that some people are kind of giving up. I don't want that to happen. So if you are in that stage, either speak up in the class or please come and see me outside. 
And the other thing I wanted to announce is this Saturday also I will have that session on Adobe Connect uh, online help for assignment between 10 and 12. The link is there on the Moodle page. You can join in. <coughs> okay, so we have seen how to handle this and we have seen the boundary condition. The next question is, remember the purpose of solving any of these problems is to actually get into design. So one of the things that we want to do is actually determine how much of heat is being transferred in watts okay, uh, through, through the base of the fence so that we know whether one fin is enough or we need ten fins because you know how much of heat is being produced you need to dissipate that so you need to be able to calculate this quantity but if I give you this okay this is the equation I have the solution the solution is given in terms of theta versus psi a graph like this using that graph and using that equation calculate Q can you do that what do you need to do this is given in terms of theta, but these are given in terms of T. Now we have that T, so we have the temperature profile. So we know this and we know T so that we can calculate the derivative, the slope, the slope at the base of the fin. That's what we want at x equal to zero. So in order to be able to calculate this Q, I need to be able to put it in a dimensionless form so that I can extract that. I can use the solution that I have for theta as a function of psi. <coughs> often what you would find is again this is also put in dimensionless form and introduced in the form of a fin efficiency you will see all these again in a heat transfer course okay <coughs> what is the fin efficiency it is indicated by symbol eta and it is given as the ratio of actual heat transferred by maximum that is possible. So that is a concept. So we are introducing a measure of how effective a fin is by saying what, how much of heat is it dissipating actually and what is the maximum that it can dissipate. What would be the maximum that you can dissipate? How would you get an expression for this? The actual one is this. Actual one is our Q. We know how to calculate that because we have an expression for that. You need to do some integration and differentiation. We will learn how to do that. But how would, the, how would I determine what is the maximum heat transfer that is possible? If I keep the fin, the entire fin, at T0, that is the profile is like this, <coughs> okay? then I'm going to have the maximum dissipation in the form of the convective heat transfer. So this maximum is going to be given by H times P times L multiplied by T0 minus T infinity. That is going to be the maximum heat transfer. If I maintain the entire fin at T0. So I take the ratio of these two and then I can use the dimensionless form. I think we are almost running out of time. I'm not going to be able to finish this. So maybe I'll stop there and we'll continue after the break. Have a good break. And Saturday I will be available if you want to come online. <coughs> Pardon me? You have a quiz on the Thursday when you come back. Right. Yes. Well, my designated office hours is on Tuesday from 1 to 3. I can change that if you want, but I'm, I'm open. Anytime I don't have a meeting, you can drop by. Feel free to drop, okay? <coughs> you will be on campus during the break? No. no. Oh. I'll be available from home. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. No, no, that's fine. Okay. What's your name? Erica, you want me to write Erica, okay, okay. okay. <coughs> We kind of started, and we were just wondering if we were looking at everything kind of right when you're done. Okay, let me just save this. <coughs>